new. It sounds a little contradictory, a new Renaissance instrument. It does. Yeah. yeah. It does. This weather, you know, yeah. it's, well, we actually, were, where we, we just were a few minutes ago, it was really, really warm. Ah, yeah. Super hot. Yeah. You okay? I think so, for now. Are we actually going to play now? I don't know. We're going to talk first. Or, or, else, or should we talk? Because <laughs> <laughs> I won't bother to tune it first. Well, why, why, why don't we talk first, okay. and then we can play. It does. My my medieval electronic tuner here. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, Anne already knows the the drill, uh, I have uh, just a brief intro and then we just chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tonight we have John Hillenbrand and Anne Acker of the Goliards which is a historically informed music ensemble specializing in pre-Baroque music, Renaissance and before. Welcome, John Hillenbrand and Ann Acker. So, um, John, tell me a little bit about your background in terms of how you got interested in this type of music. Uh, in the strangest way possible. Uh, I had a girlfriend uh, in, um, in Athens uh, who worked for the University of Georgia Library, and they had um, uh, of course, they buy a lot of CDs. This is quite a long time ago. Uh, and um, uh, people who worked there were allowed to take the CDs home and listen to them before they got cataloged. And she was always bringing these weird medieval things back and listening to them. And uh, I just got totally hooked on it. Uh, and um, uh, I don't think that she realized what a Frankenstein's monster she was creating, but uh, a after a year or so, I actually took the plunge and commissioned a VL, a medieval fiddle, and um, uh, I've been with it ever since. That's about 30 years ago. Oh. Uh, and what fascinated you about medieval music? Uh, originally, I couldn't explain it because I wasn't uh, particularly uh, knowledgeable about music at all, uh, but it seemed like it was calling to me, and um, it um, was, uh, uh, I've, I've always been interested in history, and I was always interested in the medieval period, but um, in, tr in truth, uh, the only exposure that I'd had to early music before then was uh, when I was in college, we were listening to, to people like Alfred Deller, Consort, and, and uh, New York Pro Musica Antiqua, which I found interesting, but in fact, uh, listening to their recordings now, uh, it's almost unbearable because uh, there's uh, nothing worse than early, early music. <laughs> they, uh, before they really uh, learned to do without certain uh, musical conventions. For example, the, all of the choral singing has heavy vibrato, which uh, doesn't work with, with uh, in my opinion, it doesn't work, period, but it certainly doesn't work with, with early music, uh, particularly when people are warbling at different, uh, at different rates of, uh, uh, speed and so, um, uh, uh, as I say, it's, I find those recordings impossible to listen to now. But when I was in college, I was mildly interested, and then I just forgot about it all. Uh, is that a, yeah. is that, is yeah. that an answer? Yeah. Uh, and um, listeners to this program, music local and sustainable know Ann Acker as a harpsichordist and as a Baroque musician, but you're also interested in pre-Baroque music. I love almost all music, but I will say I had friends that were in John's group and I went to one or two concerts shortly after I moved to Savannah and I would go up afterward and kind of like, what can I play with you guys? <laughs> and John would tell me the harpsichord is too late of an instrument. We can't do that. And eventually, I they managed to put this uh, instrument that's sitting to my right here, the symphony, in my hands to just start playing a, a simple drone. And I started 
playing on playing more melodic things and advancing along on that. And then I bought myself, um, and I said, well, what kind of keyboard instrument can I play? And I bought myself actually a digital form <coughs> of uh, an organ, which sounds has a very nice sound that works for our group. So I also play that with the group. And as a keyboard player, that works fine. And then just recently, you, you get hooked on it. You get hooked on it. So I, I bought myself another instrument recently and I love it I just we have so much fun it's it's a good group it always if you can have let's say you've had a really stressful day and we go to rehearsal and it's just a happy place very happy place and the music is so different and compelling it definitely has made me a much better musician at everything I do to work with this music as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the organ that you used at a recent concert of the Goliards, that is a modern device. Yes, that is a Roland C30. I first heard one when I lived in Washington, D.C., and I had gone to a concert done by Hesperus, which is quite a well-known early music group. And they were using one of these as an organ. And I thought to myself, one day I will get one, because it has a pretty decent early organ mm -hmm. type of sound mm -hmm. in it. So when one finally came up at the price I wanted to pay, I purchased it, and then I told John, and he started using it. It's technically a digital harpsichord with other sounds. The harpsichord sounds are horrible. And I don't, I've only used it for a digital harpsichord once in a venue where I just couldn't bring a real one. But uh, it, it's portable and uh, the proper ones are much more, the ones of that size get quite difficult to haul around and quite expensive. But maybe one day. So the organ is an appropriate instrument for the era. Absolutely. Especially for the uh, concert that we just did, which was 14th century Italian music, um, much of which was composed by uh, Francesco Landini, uh, who actually was the organist at the Duomo in, in Florence, and uh, uh, was the giant of Italian music in the 14th century. Yeah, you did several works by Landini. Well, he's, he's the most important composer in Italy of, of that entire century. And so he, it's pretty hard to overlook him. And he wrote good stuff. Yeah, we, we like it. Yeah, you did uh, um, a couple works uh, just for instrumental mu music. Okay. Um, you did uh, uh, Francesco Landini's um, Vaga Fanciella. Vaga Fanciulla. Fanciulla. Oh, you played that, huh? Vaga Fanciulla. Oh, yeah. Um, that was yeah. on the positive organ. Right. And then together you did a, a work by Magister Piero? Yes, uh, and uh, you know, it's funny, we don't know a great deal about him because he, uh, almost all of the work of his that survives is, is just from one codex, from the Squatchalupi Codex, uh, which was actually actually compiled um, in the early 15th century kind of as a tribute to the glories of, of Florentine music that had passed before. But uh, we don't have a surname for Magister Piero, even though he was apparently uh, someone in a, a position of judicial authority, but we only know him by that name. Does much of the music from that period come down with a name attached, or is it that very prolific composer Anonymous? Uh, Anonymous is pretty uh, pretty popular, <laughs> but um, uh, in we, the works in this concert were from mainly two sources. Uh, one. Uh, is the Rossi Codex, which uh, was compiled around 1350. And so um, uh, the presumption is that most of the things that are in, in, uh, included in it would have been done, uh, say, from 1320 on. Uh, and um, uh, there are a number of anonymous pieces in that codex. Uh, and they're also all monophonics, which means that if, if, if we want to uh, have any instrumental accompaniment, we have to either make it up or write it. Or, uh, 
and uh, uh, however, a lot of the melodies that are in the Rossi Codex are really enchanting, so it's, it's hard to overlook. The Squatch Hadoopi Codex, uh, which I mentioned a minute or so ago, uh, which was compiled uh, in the early 15th century, uh, contains all of Landini's works. I've forgotten how many there are, but I think there are about 40 or 50 of them. And, uh, and a number of other composers too. It's an immense big thing, and, and uh, we're really lucky to have it because it's, it's probably the, the most complete, well, it's certainly the most complete uh, collection of, uh, of uh, Italian music of, of the 14th century, although there are a number of other codices that have uh, music from the same period. There's nothing that's quite so complete. And from that same Squatchalupi, uh, Squatchalupi, the same Squatchalupi Codex, you did um, a work also by Jacobo da Bologna. Yeah, uh, and uh, that was the Fenice um, Fui. Fenice yeah. <laughs> Fui. Uh, that was one that Cuffy sang. And, yes. I think you were accompanying her on the organ. Now, most of the music uh, from that era was vocal music that has to be transcribed? Uh, well, we don't really know. Uh, it, it was written as vocal music because there are words underneath the, the notes, but um, we don't know uh, how instruments were used. We know that they were used, but we don't really know in what capacity, and we don't um, know precisely what instruments were used. We can only tell that from surviving illustrations and manuscripts and so, so forth. I mean, nobody really wrote a, a treatise on it. Uh, Guillaume de Machaut, a 14th century French composer, uh, did write uh, in a poem a, a catalog of all of the instruments that he used in his work, and there are a lot of them. Uh, but um, when, if, in order to be uh, as authentic as possible in the use of instruments, uh, one really uses uh, manuscript illuminations uh, as a guide more than anything else. The Squatchalupi Codex has, uh, before each composer's uh, group of, of uh, songs, has a, a portrait of the composer, although it may be a hypothetical portrait, but, but it often instruments are included in that. In Landini's case, uh, he's playing a portative organ, which is a very small organ that you sit on your lap, and, and uh, it's only played with a with the uh, I think a, uh, with one hand, and the yes. other hand um, uh, pumps the bellows to make, make the, the air go through. I have played one of those. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has one. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because you, you're playing with one hand. So you have to get enough air into it, and then you could play just as long as that air lasts. Mm -hmm. So it's very much breathe the phrase. <coughs> You're literally breathing the phrase with kind of a hot at the end, and then you play again. It's really quite marvelous. Someday I'll have one. <laughs> um, and so those, those organs didn't have like a pedal bellows. Yeah. It was a hand bellows. Yes. And the keyboard's very small too. They, yes. uh, they, I think they're usually just two octaves or so. They, Typically, yeah. yes. So you're just playing a simple melody line or a simple accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, actually, even getting into the Baroque music, instrumentation varies tremendously. Um, the French composers in particular, well, all of them, but you typically, you would write something, but you used whatever you had, whoever you had. You would put on various lines, you would use what, whatever kind of instrumentation you had, and you would come up with something that worked for you. So very similar in the earlier music, I'm sure. One thing I particularly love about working with this group is because you don't know very much about how it was done or what the instrumentation was or John does a lot of arranging and writing parts. We improvise. We can say, hmm, what shall we try now? And, and we have pretty fun jam sessions that way. It's, it's quite different from playing classical repertoire, for example. So most of the music that you play, um, John, you do the arranging? Uh, for that which requires it. Uh, the, the, it when one gets into the 14th century, uh, a lot of the music is all written out as parts. Uh, in earlier centuries, it's not. Uh, and um, in the, uh, the, f the 13th century, uh, for instance, um, 
songs are just uh, notated in Gregorian chant neumes, which don't indicate any rhythm, and um, uh, just the, the first strophe of the poem will uh, have the neumes over it, so that, uh, in fact, even incorporating other verses, the second and third verse and so forth, requires uh, counting the syllables <laughs> so that um, you get them correctly uh, spaced within the, uh, within the neumes. Um, and th frankly, that's that's my favorite, my favorite period. But um, it's harder to throw together a concert on just a few uh, rehearsals when um, when working with that period because so much of it uh, it really requires uh, evolution through rehearsal. And um, uh, for example, if if I'm accompanying a, a singer on the VL. Uh, Often I don't uh, know what I'm going to play until I actually play it, uh, and um, uh, if it sounds horrible, then I try not to. I try to remember not to do that again. So that's why it's <laughs> useful to uh, to uh, have rehearsals <laughs> and, to, and to make those mistakes in rehearsal. A, a company that's kind of evolved out of uh, what sounds good and what mm -hmm. and uh, 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 what doesn't sound good. When, when we talk about um, early Baroque music, for instance, uh, in early Baroque music, often they'll indicate the the voice of the music. In other words, there'll be a, like a soprano voice, mm -hmm. and you can switch off Correct. instruments just depending upon the those that fit within that voice. Correct. And um, often you'll double parts, like a lower voice will double um, mm -hmm. with the harpsichord, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, do you see similar things in this type of era, too, in the Renaissance and before, uh, that they just wrote for a voice, and then you, you substitute the instrumentation that matches that? Yeah, uh, before the Baroque period, there's no such thing as an obligato instrument. You know, the, the one, this has to be accompanied by a viola da gamba, or this mm -hmm. has to be accompanied by a harpsichord. Uh, it's really, as Anne was mentioning, with regard to uh, some of the early Baroque pieces that, that she's performed, uh, you use whatever means you have at hand. And um, uh, we don't, polyphony uh, did not get written down uh, in um, uh, precise rhythmic notation until, well, they c one could notate rhythmic modes, and that was used, uh, say, around 1200 in the, the Notre Dame school. Uh, but it wasn't until about 1250 that uh, a man, a uh, monk uh, named Franco of Cologne, uh, devised a way by uh, uh, wherever he inserted a note called a plica into a neum of Gregorian chant neums. Uh, would indicate precisely what the rhythm would be. And so uh, uh, we don't know exactly what year he came up with this idea, but it caught on in a hurry because for the first time uh, people could uh, indicate uh, rhythm precisely. And so uh, by the 14th century, uh, composers were really rel reveling in, in um, that freedom. And of course they chose many complicated rhythms because of it. They, they, uh, uh, they, they'd never been able to do that before, and so it was really a huge breakthrough. Uh, I think I'm wandering away from the question. Uh, I don't remember, but you're, it sounds great to me. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, the now for each concert that you do. Um, what sort of goes in into the planning of a concert? Uh, it depends on the personnel, largely. Uh, for instance, we're, we're very much in a rebuilding mode at the moment uh, because we lost uh, uh, two sopranos uh, who moved out of town and we lost our harpist. And so um, we're, at the moment, just a trio. And uh, so uh, if we're planning a concert, we, we plan things that will work for a trio. And, uh, I try to keep in mind the instruments that we that we have, uh, but um, 
uh, in the past, uh, if you look on the, on the back of the program notes, you, uh, we have kind of a biography of the group. And um, so we've been around almost 20 years now. And um, uh, we've done some pr productions that were very large scale mm -hmm. and uh, you know, had, had both a men's choir and a women's choir and a number of instruments with them too. So uh, uh, that's what determines what the program's going to be, basically. It's um, with the, what are the forces that we have. Now, the, in the most recent concert that you did, um, you had, of course, we talked about the organ, mm -hmm. and it was referred to as a positive organ. Is that the just the name for the electronic uh, it organ? Means, well, there, there are two types of, of, of organ uh, that were used in the medieval times. There's the portative, which sat on one's knee, mm -hmm. and the positive, which means it's something you could place. Mm -hmm. You could place on a tabletop. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's the kind of sound that her synthetic uh, organ produces. Uh, and it has this more or less the same size keyboard as a positive mm -hmm. organ would have had. The portative had maybe a keyboard this wide, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so it was much more limited in its, in its range. And that's the, the portative of organ is the one that would have the 20 keys. Yeah, yeah and, and, and portative meaning you can carry it with you. You can yeah. take it, carry it around. Yeah. Yeah, they're very light, very small, whereas, yeah, the, the mine is modeled after the larger type that you can pick up and Actually, put fit somewhere and maybe find somebody to help you carry it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That might be the definition. <laughs> and how much range does that have? Oh, gosh, that's about four octaves, I think. Okay. I never really thought about it. <laughs> it's it about covers what you need to cover. It's about four octaves, I think, yeah. Okay. I tend not to use the low, low, low bass ones because like most electronic keyboards, the low bass, I don't particularly like the sound of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not just, this particular instrument really, it's not an electronic keyboard with a harpsichord stop or, or an organ stop like most electronic keyboards are. This one was designed for simulating harpsichord music or organ mm. music or forte piano music so they've actually gone to a lot more trouble to sample the right kind of sounds and to get some of the like in the organ sound you actually get the distinctive chiff of a real organ in the sound the chiff it, the chiff is this little thing that happens right when you're opening closing the pipe uh. it has to do with the air uh. this little thing it's called the chiff and it's actually there that's one reason it sounds so good whereas if you just play I can only pick out a good one, you know, a, a good uh, keyboard. And there are some good ones out there, but they don't have that. They don't. They really don't have that. And even the harpsichord stop has got a pluck sound in it, unlike the other digital ones. So I forget the question. Uh, rambling. No. Now the uh, uh, so the so so in in the concert there were some that included the positive organ mm -hmm. along with the VL. Mm -hmm. uh, some that were the positive organ alone, mm -hmm. some with a positive organ and the singer, yep. and some with a VL, positive organ, and the singer. Yeah, John makes me work. Yeah. <laughs> and since there are only three of us and a limited instrumental color, I tried to mix things up as, as much as I could. Mm -hmm. Without I mean, the, the the thing that's uh, to be avoided, if if possible, is constantly switching instruments. You know, uh, Putting one down and picking another one up and playing that because with, with uh, stringed instruments that's risky because they they are they have a tendency to be um, uh, unstable in tuning particularly mine are strung with gut and, and uh, uh, they're un, uh, unbelievably responsive to atmospheric and bar uh, barometric uh, influences. So let's talk about some of the other instruments that you had there. Um, the viol, of course. The viol is the precursor to really it looks like a viola. Uh, well, it, it, that's a safe assertion. The viol uh, first uh, starts appearing in medieval iconography shortly after the First Crusade, which was in 1098. And um, uh, it had a lifespan that ran into the middle of the 16th century. Uh, so it was around um, almost as long as the modern violin has been around. Uh, but it's it's definitely the forerunner of it. Most of, of the VLs that, uh, that people use nowadays have five strings. Uh, in medieval iconography, they often have as few as three. But five is the 
is the usual number. Uh, and um, there are some, some tunings uh, that have survived from uh, a, another monk's writing, a fellow named Jerome of Moravia. Uh, and those give some indication of, of uh, how, how these instruments were tuned. And because of, the, the, because of that, one can sort of get an idea of how they were played. Uh, and um, uh, in iconography, they're depicted as having uh, flat bridges a lot of the time. And so the, uh, the uh, inference is that, that um, uh, they would be playing uh, drones quite a bit of the time, more than one, more than one string at a time. Uh, by uh, the late 15th century, uh, in Italy, uh, an instrument called the lira da braccia the lyre of, of the, the arm, arm right? uh, which uh, clearly evolved from the from the VL, it became really popular for about a century. Uh, it was a seven-string version of the hmm. the VL. It had two drone strings that ran off the off of the fingerboard. Uh, and in fact, Leonardo da Vinci was an expert on the lyre de braccia and, and um, uh, often described himself as as a, a a musician rather than as an inventor or an artist. Or, uh, he, he apparently had a, a, a very pleasant bass voice and would accompany himself uh, in song. Uh, there, um, Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose, sank uh, around 14, uh, sorry, around 1545 or 6. I'm not sure of the exact year, but, but it, uh, they managed to bring it back to the service in the 1980s, and they found uh, two VLs not in very good condition <laughs> on, the, on, on the wreck of the, the Mary Rose. And so um, it, it uh, uh, indicates a couple of things uh, that they're still in use then, even though uh, they were definitely mutating towards the violin. And we don't know how those two fiddles would have been tuned, but they're usually uh, when people build reconstructions of them, they usually uh, give them four strings and um, uh, tune them in fifths as a violin would, would be tuned. Uh, but um, uh, by uh, 1575 or so, the, um, the Amatis were make, making violins, and uh, they had pretty much the same shape as they had today. Uh, yeah. There's some differences, but, but uh, they, they had the... Um, uh, you would recognize an Amati violin from the 16th century immediately as, as a violin. It's not a, uh, but um, this this VL is is uh, based on 15th century iconography, and um, it's uh, uh, actually a very fine instrument. It's the, the best one that I own. Uh, I have a lot of them. Hmm. Uh, John has a lot of cool toys. <laughs> But um, uh, this, this is made by, by a very good maker, and it's, it really projects. It's, it's a, loud, a loud instrument, which is what performers want. And, and the fifth string is actually a lower string? Uh, well, this, is, this is particular instrument is not tuned at all like a violin. It's uh -huh. a, the lowest string on it is a D, which is one note above the viola's lowest note. Uh -huh. And um, then it's got a G string, as a viola would have, a D string above that. Uh, but it, the next string up is a G also. And the top string on this, I keep it C, just because um, I like to have um, uh, uh, the E flat, which I can play with my second finger in the first position, with that, which uh, 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 can be quite painful sometimes <laughs> if, if you use your first finger to play that. <laughs> that note flat, so uh, th that gives me a pretty good range, uh, enough of a range to do just about anything that we're uh, we're ever likely to do to play. Uh, I have uh, a bunch of instruments which have far different tunings. Uh, one of my favorite combinations uses a double D string, so that you can uh, play uh, an entire scale from D to up to D. With a constant D drone, which uh, is uh, is nice to to be able to do, but it's less useful for the later medieval music, mm -hmm. such as it was in this 
particular program where I was playing pretty much monophonically without uh, droning a lot. Well, you had a drone instrument as part of that concert as well that Anne plays, that symphony. The symphony? Symphony. Mm -hmm. It's a type of hurdy gurdy. Uh huh. Uh, it, it, yes, it was the first thing John let me play. <laughs> Because all you have to be able to do in the simplest mode is just turn to crank. And it has a, a rosined wheel and three strings. The middle string is the drone. It just always plays the same pitch. And the two outer strings, your radio audience cannot see that there are tangents that are controlled by keys that when I press them, I can change the pitch of them, those, the pair of strings together to place a melody line or change the harmony a little bit. But that, that drone is always going through. I mean, they, they love drones. And why the drone sound? Um, well, uh, it was a, a, a great appeal to medieval eras. I mean, we, we, can, we know that uh, even from early uh, Notre Dame organ, which would have been just uh, vocal, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the idea of, of uh, singing to one constant note was uh, the mm -hmm. way people learned how to sing. They, in fact, there's an instrument which is the precursor to the hurdy gurdy called the organistrum, mm -hmm. which uh, takes actually as a, it's a two man instrument because one cranks and the other uh, moves the tangents because organistra were really big instruments. That, uh, and um, they were um, used, we know, in training choirs. We don't know if they actually used them in performance in, in church, right. because uh, uh, a lot of churchmen took a very dim view of instruments in, in holy music. Uh, in fact, the organ was, uh, so far as we know, was, was until the end of the Renaissance period, was the only instrument that was allowed to be used in church or in a church service. Yes. Uh, but um, uh, the, the fact is that, that so many clerics fulminated about instruments uh, being used for um, holy music implies that maybe they were used from time to time, yeah. time, time uh, because it, it uh, uh, definitely got a lot of churchmen uh, quite upset. You know, that, uh, uh, minstrels, uh, people who, who played instruments professionally, were a pretty low class of, uh, of, of people in medieval Europe. They were not highly respected. They were thought of as uh, maybe a step above beggars, but not. Uh, they were not a highly esteemed uh, class of society. And so, as a result, they. It wasn't dignified enough to be, or sacred enough to be in church? So far as we know. Uh, the, in the 15th century, uh, other instruments uh, start appearing in, in um, uh, paintings and, and uh, uh, illuminations. Normally, uh, they would be in the form of a consort of angels playing right. instruments, and um, uh, they would have a the complete panoply of, of every instrument that was available at the time being played by angels. So I guess they uh, gained a sort of a measure of respectability uh, over, the over the course of, say, the late 14th century into the 15th century. But, but um, uh, it, if one were trying to reproduce uh, something that was liturgical from, say, 1300, uh, and to be as accurate as we can make it, uh, since we don't, there's a lot that we'll never know about um, how things were done. Uh, one probably would not use instruments at all. It would be mm. completely sung. Uh, but a uh, hundred years later, uh, things uh, loosened up. Now the music that you played, um, those are madrigals and ballads. Is that just common music? Uh, the madrigal uh, of the 14th century, is, it's different from the uh, Renaissance madrigal, uh, is usually a two-part uh, composition, and often it can be completely canonic. I mean, both parts are 
basically the same, but are just um, staggered. Are staggered. Uh, Cuffy and I did one that was like that um, uh, in the, the last the last concert. Uh, but um, uh, it, the Madrigal is usually a two two part piece in, in uh, 14th century Italy. Uh, it was a form that was uh, only used in Italy at that time. The ballata uh, is also uh, a popular Italian form, but it's identical with the French virelay, which means that you have a, an A section and a B section, and uh, it's really a poetic fixed form. Uh, the, it goes A, the B section we always repeat, so it's A, B, B, and then there are always two A sections, and that completes a, a phrase. You know, it, it often, um, uh, often there would be more than one verse, in which case the, the final A, which is the same as the very first A, uh, would only go at the end of the piece, but not in between verses. Uh, the um, ballare, the verb uh, from which ballata is derived, means to dance. Uh, and the virile was also uh, an early dance form, but it was, it was uh, used by poets often in uh, works that, that didn't actually have any music. Now, in addition to the viau, during that concert you played a rebeck. Yeah, uh, I have one over there. Uh, the, those were uh, well, boat string instruments. Usually, didn't have didn't have as many strings. Sometimes as few as two. Uh, they uh, can be traced directly to the Arabic rebab, which is still played today. Yes. Uh, the uh, the rebabs in, in uh, North Africa uh, are usually spike fiddles, and so they they were usually played sitting down with an underhanded bow grip. Uh, they start appearing in, in European medieval iconography about the same time as VL. So they, it's something people brought back from, from the First yeah. Crusade. And um, uh, it was also a very popular instrument. It actually had a longer lifespan than the VL did they, because they, they were still in use in the 18th century, but uh, mainly by beggars. They, they had sort of lost their, their aura of respectability. And um, uh, so, uh, the, uh, they, I guess you could say in a way, they don't play well with others. They, uh, it's a kind of a funny sounding instrument uh, because they, they are dry and- Very nasal. And very nasal. And um, in, the, in the 16th century, people did actually have consorts of Rebecs. They, they came wow. in different sizes. And the, the few times that I've heard people playing four different size Rebex at the same time, it's pretty strange. I mean, it's, it, it takes, uh, it's like uh, another popular 16th century instrument, the crumb horn. It takes a, sort of a, uh, an acquired taste to, to, uh, to listen to it and, and uh, enjoy it. Uh, because we did this concert at, at A415, which is kind of the standard Baroque uh, pitch uh, and um, uh, just today uh, we switched back to A440 which yes. is the, the modern standard pitch uh, I, I haven't actually tuned this rhetoric uh, but since uh, the, the pieces that we did in the program involve the organ which we don't have right. here uh, we this I'm not going to uh, Retune this if it's in any semblance of being in tune with itself. Solo noodle. I think a lot of modern people don't realize how much our modern instruments in their evolution owe to the Arabic influence. Yeah. This, from this does. It's, it's hopelessly out of tune, but um, you can uh, hear what it's sort of a mosquito-like <laughs> timbre it has, anyway. And that also has a very flat bridge. Uh, yeah, this this uh, it's it's flatter than a than a violin bridge would be, 
but it's also just three strings, so that mm -hmm. the, the uh, it you can. You can you can bow the the individual strings without uh, colliding with, the, with their neighbors. And it's interesting because those two are very contemporaneous instruments to each other, but they but the reback looks so ancient compared to the the, well, the early, um, other the, the VL looks more the sophisticated. Early VLs, uh, the early VLs, as I say, this one's based on 15th century iconography. Okay. Uh, the ones that first start showing up in the 12th century in iconography usually have a figure eight shape, and um, they're also played in the gamba position, uh, which means mm -hmm. on the knee yeah. and with an underhand with bow grip. Uh, those pretty much disappeared by the um, from iconography uh, by the middle of the next century, and, and the, the most common shapes of the L's were guitar-shaped like that, uh, but usually with D-shaped sound holes. Mm. And um, the uh, the other shape that was common with the L's was oval, also the D, yes. the D shape sound awesome. hole, uh, if, uh, and the the oval fiddles were still uh, in iconography through the 15th century, but, but um, they often had a, a drone string that was off the fingerboard, mm -hmm. that would um, so it couldn't be stopped, but uh, it could be plucked. And so the theory is that it might have been used uh, to be plucked rhythmically, uh, but uh, it could also be bowed. It just couldn't be the tone, the note couldn't be changed on it. And in addition to those instruments, we heard the gittern. Yes, my little gittern. It's a new baby. It's a new old instrument. I uh, commissioned it from a fellow up in New York State this summer after one he has. His name is John Bronka. He lives in the rural, this little rural town in the mountains in New York State. And he had one like this. This one is based on uh, illuminations, images from the Cantigas de Santa Maria. And it is definitely in a more Spanish style of design that it has multiple sound holes. But like one of the reasons which has probably little to do with its musical capability, but it makes me very happy, so that does affect its musical capability, is that it has a head on top of the, the neck. It has the head of a dragon, which, how can you not love an instrument with the head of a dragon on it, right? <laughs> uh, this one has three strings. They had three or four, sometimes more strings, but if they had more, they were being uh, have pairs of unisons typically, so three different pitches is typical for these things. So you can get you know a, a simple chord and you can play around. This one does not have any frets like it in, in the picture. So I'm, I'm would love to know if anyone knows that they they slide them. Like <laughs> I don't know if they do or not, but it, it does mean you can really change the intonation, you know, the relative positions of the intervals. And if you do think back, like these also came over, came up from the Arab world. Um, but then eventually evolved into guitars, guitar and guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're quite amazing. I mean, some of the pictures show frets, but this, this, one, this one does not. Um, it's got a very long body. And it's my new friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and you played it in a strumming manner. Yes. Um, again, one of the songs that you played at the concert was with Viel and Gitterne yes. from that um, very prolific composer, Anonymous. Right. Didn't and by the way, um, those who have listened to this this uh, show quite well know that I stole that from Anne. The, the phrase. You did? Uh, the, this, the very popular composer of the period, Anonymous. Oh. I stole that from her. Uh, I love that phrase. Good. Uh, so, the, um, and so in that case, the, the gittern was sort of like a background strumming instrument where the really the melody was carried by the VL. Well, for this concert, yes, because I had only had it two weeks before we played the concert, so I'm not really, I'm, I'm learning how to play it. I, I played guitar when I was in college long ago, 
and this is the first portable, I mean, this is the first guitar-like instrument that I've played since then, so we're working up to, but you, you can play, you can pluck it as well, you can do, you know, pluck melody. I mean, you can, we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay. It's, um, I describe it to people as my medieval uh, ukulele, because it's about the same size as a baritone ukulele, and yeah. has a a lot of similarities of sounds and it fits in a baritone ukulele case perfectly so it's it's good fun i'm enjoying it so i guess let's play some tunes i guess okay we're gonna need to tune okay for this weather yeah what do you want to do the this one first Oh, yeah, why don't we hear that first? Well, for... we have a piece we can do together. Oh, okay. We, we actually played it at the concert with our singer, but we don't need a singer. <laughs> but let's get tuned up or it's going to sound really bad. And I'm sitting right next to the heater, so uh, it feels good on me, but who knows what it's doing to this. And, and the symphony has sort of like tuning... Tuning screws at the mm -hmm. end. Yep. That you tune into. It's interesting too, uh, the bows of these instruments actually give rise to, now you know why they're called bows. Exactly. Because they look like bows. You could, you could pretty well fit an arrow to that and yeah. hit somebody. It actually looks exactly like the bow that my mother had and we played with as a little girl that was made for her by Native Americans mm. back where she grew up. Little, little child's bow. I think we will look at it. Okay, I gotta check this one. Oh, you're doing so good. And this song is Echo La Primavera. It was the first one in the program. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to start that over. We again. we love radio because you can edit. Yeah. <laughs> Different chair? No, it's okay. I'm all right. I, I, need to, I need to tune this up again. Sure. My D string is flat. It's huge changes in the, it's really yeah. cool. the weather in general. I mean, it's really hot in St. Paul. So I you know it's authentic instruments. Wow, this is. It may have been better for me to come to you.
Yeah, that, that's really interesting, that, that drone sound, but then you modify the drone, right. basically, with the keys. And I explain to people, it's just like playing the piano, except that you're playing with your hand where you can't see it, and your hand is upside down, and the keys are all different sizes, so it's just like playing the piano. <laughs> just like playing the piano, but totally different. But totally different. <laughs> so also, it's gravity that makes the tangents go back. Go down, right. Go back. So I have to have it pointing that way, or they don't fall away from the string. One thing I forgot to mention before, a neat thing about this instrument, which I gradually discovered, is that when you have this continuous sound as you turn the crank, and you can you can pulse it. So it also becomes a rhythm instrument. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, cool. Um, want to do Should we try the Amor Mi Fa Cantara yeah. or Francesca? Let me check this one. I should just play your G. Can you want to lower? I gotta turn it, it's bad. Yeah. And this is the one where you you um, had it on the wrong page. Yeah, and I you, faked it at the concert. You faked it totally. At the concert. That's what no, that's what a pro does. <laughs> you fake it. So we, we can compare this performance with. No, that. don't. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot show the other one. You cannot play it. Yeah, that's why I selected for uh, the the one from the concert is the uh, Per Troppo Fede. Oh, we're going to redo that one too. Yeah. Oh, you wanted to redo that one too? Yeah. Okay. Okay, what do you want again? <laughs> uh, I'm on, I'm over me five. I know, but what tempo do you want to get? Hang on a second. Then this is a new instrument for me here. Thank you. 
to see you on stage with an electric guitar? <laughs> don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Now, among Baroque players, they're often um, Arguments start breaking out when you talk about historically informed music. Is the same thing true of pre-Baroque players? Oh yeah, yeah, particularly in the 14th century, because uh, uh, there are some conventions that uh, modern uh, performers just can't agree on, and that's the most uh, common one is is a term called musica ficta, which means uh, accidental uh, sharps uh, that are placed uh, that are not notated in the actual text but we know uh, would have been played uh, particularly uh, a raised leading tone right before the last uh, note of a cadence uh, but a lot of people uh, dispute that those musica ficta should be should actually be performed and so some pretty intense arguments arise from time to time, but, but um, uh, uh, there uh, was a treatise written by a man named Philippe de Vitry uh, in, I think, in 1320 called um, uh, Ars Nova, which means the new art, and he did describe several uh, conventions that continued to be used really well into the 15th century, uh, and that is that uh, in a two-part piece, uh, as um, uh, parts draw, as the two parts draw together uh, at a cadence, uh, all thirds and sixths will be made minor. Uh, and as they draw apart to an, uh, an octave or a unison, uh, sorry, if they draw together toward uh, toward a fifth or a unison, the, all the the thirds and sixths will become minor. And if they draw apart. Uh, uh, to an octave uh, or moving apart to a fifth and then they become major and um, in order to, to make that happen uh, it usually involves putting a sharp in where e even if it's not notated in the original in the original text but that's the kind of thing that people really squabble over though and um, I'm sure that there are plenty of others that, uh, that I could think of but I uh, I haven't really had to think about that too much because uh, I've been the one who arranges all the music, and so uh, we, we, we don't, do we don't have sets. that kind of dispute in, in, in this group. We're just so grateful. John does all the research, hands us the music, and we show up and play. It's great. And that's to contrast with Savannah Baroque. Where well, I do all do the research <laughs> at the end. <laughs> exactly. And it has given me tremendous appreciation for the amount of work he does. <laughs> it's just, uh, you, to do it really well, I think, to make the music sound convincing, it really does help to be as knowledgeable as possible so that you can, it, it was what it was, and if you get closer to your knowledge of that, somehow the music comes to life more, it's more exciting, it's not so dry. I mean, again, some of the, the early revival of early music, some of that stuff is really painful to listen to, but of course it's easy to shoot the pioneers in the backs as they're leaving, and they did good things. But the more we've learned, the more exciting the music is coming, becoming, I think, for 
this period as, as well as the later period of music. I, I find this period of music particularly in, interesting, exciting, because they didn't have all the rules and conventions that started settling down. And by the time you get to Rameau's treatises of how harmony should be, and uh, they, they don't have that, and they're experimenting, and you have these very challenging rhythms going on, and you're playing different rhythms from the person you're standing next to, and the harmonies are different, and the voice leadings are, and the voices are moving in ways that really, really challenges you, really challenges you, and it sounds really cool, very, almost very modern in style. That was one of the people after the concert came up to me and said, wow, that stuff has got all these things going on. It actually sounds almost like, in some places, very avant-garde modern mm -hmm. composition and that there's no time. And it's, it's, it's fun and challenging, mm -hmm. and I like it. Toward the, the very end of the 14th century, uh, the uh, musical style uh, th that was used largely in, in France uh, took on a new term called ars superior, which meant the, the more subtle art as opposed to the ars nova, the new art. And um, that is uh, rhythmically about as complicated as any music that's ever existed. Uh, it's so much so that one doesn't just throw together a, a, pro a program with you know, three rehearsals of, uh, uh, and um, uh, expect to perform it because each part may be in a completely different rhythmic mode from, from the others and, and um, interpretation of musicologist transcriptions but for one thing it's fiendishly hard to transcribe uh, and musicologists who, trans who have transcribed in the past probably never expected it to be performed and uh, so they would take a lot of um, uh, liberties when they ended up mm. with more notes than they knew what to do with. They would uh, run them all together and put a seven over them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, uh, you, can't, you can't play from, from that kind of notation. Right, right. Uh, uh, so it requires uh, reinterpretation. Re However, the, the neumes that are used in the R. subtilia notation are pretty tough to, to, uh, to transcribe. I, mm. I would... I usually let uh, use. I will usually use an addition for that because it's just a, a, a headache and uh, can't be done without a, a crib sheet. And uh, how they performed it uh, back then, when most musicians were not even musically literate, I don't know. It's, it's uh, uh, pretty pretty amazing. But the uh, I think it's more a testament to what the human mind is capable of, of remembering because yeah. these pieces were probably all performed from, from memory and they're so complicated that, that uh, um, it, well, I'm impressed by, by uh, at least by the idea of how, how it was done. I, talk a little bit about the bow. Again, we mentioned earlier that it's bow-shaped, and hence the name. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, it's kind of like something Fred Flintstone would, would use. Uh, <laughs> it um, uh, has a, uh, has an arc. There, there are all kinds of bows depicted in medieval uh, iconography. Uh, this actually is the first one that I ever had, and I've just uh, liked to to have it. It's uh, like to use it more than any, any others, but. Um, uh, it has one drawback in that it is it does tend to bounce a little on the strings just because of the convex uh, arc of it. Uh, this is a, another similar uh, bow, but it actually has a, has a frog built into the, into the structure, but you can't, the, you can't loosen the hair on these. Mm -hmm. you know, it's always tight. They have black horse hair. Uh, because um, it really grips the gut strings, and uh, it's almost indestructible. It, it lasts much longer than white horse hair. Uh, this, uh, I've had this bow rehaired once in about 20 years, and uh, 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 so they are pretty, pretty tough in that respect. But so, uh, you see sometimes uh, iconography bows with big handles on them, and uh, there's just absolutely no standardization at, the, at that time or of the instruments either. They, they all look different they, uh, yes. from one another and, and uh, uh, 
probably people tuned them to suit their own convenience rather than, than uh, because there was a, uh, a rule as there is with modern string instruments and violins or uh, uh, in, in Western in Western Europe a European canon are, are always tuned in fifths uh, in the um, Near Eastern and Middle Eastern uh, violin playing which uh, uh, has supplanted the rebab in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. they, they usually tune the instrument, the violins, G D G D, so they're in, in fourths and octaves, uh, and that, that's a very viol-like tuning. A lot of people tune their viols mm -hmm. the same the same way. Uh, now, this type of music is really niche in terms of popularity. <laughs> um, people listen to what they're used to hearing. If you grow up in an area where country music is the big thing, you listen to a lot of country music growing up. And if you hang out in the halls of Oxford, you would probably hear this sort of thing. If you, you know, it, it's so yes. Uh, you could say there is a. a audience which once I find people come to hear it they like it though I mean we had people at this last concert that had never been to such a thing and they're like wow I really like this I'm going to watch the more it's it's really a question of exposure it's it, it, it's more common in, in a certain metropolitan areas in yeah. America Boston uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, Seattle and uh, New York are probably the the places where right. the, the enthusiasm for early music is, is most intense. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, the really early stuff, so what we do, uh, is much more popular than it is in, in America. Uh, and there are dozens, literally dozens, of first-class ensembles in, in Europe. While right. In America, there really are only a few who are performing medieval music. Uh, the, uh, the war between uh, Baroque uh, performers and standard repertory performers uh, has pretty much ended now. The, even the Juilliard uh, School has a, has a Baroque uh, music program and, and uh, there uh, are a number of, of uh, conservatories in the, in the country that, that are, are uh, teaching historically informed uh, uh, performance practice, although uh, rarely with an, with an emphasis on the really early stuff. The right. Indiana University, uh, when um, their uh, historical performance school, whatever that's called, I'm, I'm sure it has another name, was uh, headed by, um, uh, oh, what was his name now? Um, uh, 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 completely lost lost his name. Uh, 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 Thomas Binkley. Binkley, yes. Thomas Binkley. <laughs> yes, Thomas Binkley. Uh, uh, was uh, very heavily invested in medieval music, but um, uh, now I think it's um, uh, uh, pretty much uh, Baroque and um, uh, not even much Renaissance music. Mostly Baroque really, now, yes. Uh, so we're, we're definitely not on the more popular end of the musical spectrum. Uh, and I suspect that, that uh, we all have a few loose screws or we wouldn't be doing this <laughs> at, at all. But um, uh, we're, we're pretty harmless. And, and it was interesting, too. I think it was in the 70s that there was a big push with sort of modernized Gregorian chants. So they put music to the yeah. background oh, behind the yeah. <laughs> Your audience oh. cannot see John cringing. <laughs> <laughs> they're, oh, they're, they're, uh, after the Benzedrine monks came out with that best selling. Oh, thing, yes. Thing, then, then everybody was putting uh, synthesizers. Yes. There was one yes. ghastly album of Hildegard of Bingen uh, by a very respectable soprano, Emily Van Evra, but it, it, with a synthesizer accompaniment. And it, it's the, the most hideous thing I think I've ever heard. But I think it, she sold a lot of records. And, and <laughs> it, but it was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, motivated by, uh, uh, it had pecuniary motives. Yeah, and people were trying to merge the old and the new. And 
I can't blame them for trying. You know, and, and sometimes it can work. Sometimes it can work very well. Well, the Monks album was straightforward, Gregorian chant. It, yes. it amazed everybody that it took off and, and uh, uh, became so popular. And they, yeah. uh, they've tried to follow it up ever since, but uh, it was a short-lived uh, popularity, I think. The uh, ensemble Anonymous Four, uh, which uh, disbanded a couple of years ago, but was around for ages, yes. uh, actually sold a lot of uh, a lot of albums. They um, uh, also sort of cracked the market, uh, but it's rare that that, that happens. Yeah. Uh, people don't go into medieval music with the idea of getting rich, as it no. were. No. And there is a early music ensemble that's going to be part of the Savannah Music Festival this year. There will be, s oh, which one was that? Stila Antico. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Stila Antico. Yes, yeah, they'll be coming, yes. So that should raise the profile it for early music. It should help. They, they bring in something every other year. Um, yes. I, I, if there's harpsichords at the Savannah Music Festival, they're mine. You know, I, I'm, so I'm pretty much up on what they're doing there. Yes. <laughs> so yes, this year there will be some things. There's also going to be, uh, Daniel Hope is, going, is bringing in an orchestra from Europe, and they're doing some Baroque music, but they are not a Baroque orchestra. So there will be this thing that's, it, it's sort of a hybrid between historically informed performance and modern orchestra training. So, you know, at least people get to, to hear the Baroque music. Yeah. yeah, and they'll be doing um, from, yeah, I'm, I'm as bad as names these days as you are, uh, Sebastian Nauer. Sebastian yeah. Nauer is going to be doing from his Uber Bach album. Yes. Which, again, is a an interesting twist. It, it, well said. I think we won't discuss that anymore. <laughs> I work with these people. <laughs> no, he sees a talented, talented keyboard player. Yes, yes. Very talented keyboard player. And it, it was a very interesting approach. Yes. To yes. to baroque music. Yes. So tonight we have had John Hillenbrand and Ann Acker of the Goliards, which is an historic historically informed music ensemble specializing in music before Baroque, back to the Renaissance and even before the Renaissance. And so I want to thank you both very much for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Dave. It's always good fun. Thank you. All right. It is fun. My hatred was getting out of tune there, but oh well. Yeah. It was not a bit <laughs> sour. <laughs>